Hey everybody, it's 12 o'clock and it's Tuesday. You know what that means, Randy? I do. What does it mean? It's time for me to answer questions. Time for Randy yeah. to answer some questions. And man, you all came rolling in with the questions this week. Um, normally it's like 11 o'clock and we have one question and we're all in a panic and then they come later. They started coming in last Tuesday. That's great. And they've been, uh, I think the Bible Institute uh, inspired some questions here too. Okay. Normally we tell you if you have a question, add it in the comment section. Don't do that today. No, if you want to, go right ahead. We no, just, no, we still love to have them. Yes, yeah, we because would love that. If we don't get them this week, we'll do them we next week. We just might not get to it this week. And I've got a plane to catch because i got to get to Las Vegas, Randy. Got some gambling to do. Yeah, got some gambling to do. I really am heading to Las Vegas. It's just that um, I'm going to visit my aunt. You might play a little bingo. I don't know. It's her It's her hobby. So, I understand. You know, my 82-year-old aunt, if she wants to play bingo, Randy, you go play some bingo. You know yes, yes. All right. Now, can you win money at bingo in, in Las Vegas? Yes, you can. Okay. You can win a lot of money at okay. bingo. Well, but if you win a lot of money, uh, remember remember the, the kingdom. I certainly will. I never win. But um, anyhow, I would tell you all about how they play bingo out there, but we got too many questions Okay, here, so all right. Here we in. go. Say hi to us. Let us know you're there. We're glad you're here. And let's rock and roll. Randy, uh, this is a question based off Sunday's message. You started Journey to Destiny, and you were talking about vision mm -hmm. for our lives. And so someone says, how do we know God is calling us if we're scared, if we are qualified? Which kind of was everything Moses was, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, well, we, what we know is this. We know God is calling us, first of all, to return to him in trust. And then once we've returned to him in trust, he's calling us to grow, to develop, to become the Christ-like version of ourselves that he created us to be. We, we know that. That's his calling for each and every one of us. We know that in the context of that developmental cycle, he's also calling us to a, a set of good works, if you want to call it that, a set of good deeds. Now, they're going to be different for each and every person. And this is where, you know, we, we start having to prayerfully kind of move our way through this process and, and we have to assess some things we have to assess you know well um, what are my past experiences what is my temperament type what are my abilities or talents what spiritual gifts do I think I've received from God uh, what opportunities um, are available to me what roles and re relationships and responsibilities do I need to make sure are, are being cared for the way God wants so there's a lot of things to, to put into this and um, then I, I would only add to that there, there should be some um, supportive reason, or, or let me rephrase it, there should be some affirmation of our sense of calling from the body of Christ. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 12 that, you know, we're different parts of the body of Christ. There's eyes and ears and hands and all these different things, and we're to work in conjunction. What I've learned through the years is that, let's say, for example, I, I start thinking, well, I think God's called me to do some teaching and some leading. Well, if that's the case, there ought to be evidence that I have both leadership abilities and teaching abilities that are affirmed by other people in the body of Christ or the body of Christ overall. If there's no affirmation, uh, then I have to ask myself, why do I believe I have these, these gifts or callings? And, and that's the other part of it, that uh, a gift is a calling. If God's given you a certain spiritual gift, whether it's teaching, serving, whatever, that, that is a calling to use it. So... I, I'm not quite sure. This is one of these questions where I'd like to have a personal conversation with a person. Um, I'm not quite sure what they mean by scared or uh, are they qualified. Uh, obviously, Moses felt both. He felt fear and he didn't feel qualified, and yet God was truly calling him. Mm -hmm. I will say this. Uh, what I've observed through the years is that sometimes we're scared and we doubt that we're qualified because we're not qualified. We, we haven't been gifted or uh, experience sufficient to do something. So sometimes we, we mistake. We get grandiose ideas. We feel we're, we're called to do something um, that in society's mind, in our mind, might be great, but God often feels like great is something that we might, would consider inconsequential. And so, you know, here again, this is one of these things where it's, it's awfully difficult to answer this person's question without right. talking to them specifically. Yeah, so. yeah. But we are all called to return to him yeah. to be the best version of ourselves, the best mom we can be, the best spouse, the best uh, dad, whatever, you know. Yeah, and, and in that context, there's a, 
a body of serving opportunities that are that are critical for our ongoing development to become the Christ-like person we were meant to be. So those things we're all called to. Yeah. And so if this person ever wants to try to sort through this better, again, I strongly urge them, give me a call, come in, sit down, talk, and, and I'll try to be more helpful. Yeah. Okay. And this next question relates to the message as well. So because you kind of talked about that moment when you know God's talking mm-hmm. to you or, or commu- you know, trying to speak something to you. And I think you even talked about the illustration of the quiet eye and mm-hmm. uh, the cool. And so they say, what if you miss your enlightenment? Will he keep trying? How do you discern that it is God speaking to you? Uh, yeah, obviously he always keeps trying because creation is always around you and the scriptures are always available to you and the churches are always communicating God's voice to you. So uh, even if you know you've had the moment where God's trying to get your attention in a, in a more significant way, but you've, for whatever reason, dismissed it, weren't comfortable with it, he's, he's going to continue to try until your last breath. Mm-hmm. So that part is clear. And um, the second, second part of the question, what was it? Uh, how do you discern that it was uh, God I, I didn't know it's God speaking to you. Because he's always going to be revealing more about himself. You're going to be drawn to know the truth about God himself. And he's going to draw you toward the scriptures. He's going to draw you toward his church. He's going to be um, drawing you to know himself as he has revealed himself in Christ and in the scriptures. So that's how you can tell it's God. Now we're away from questions that are from Sunday's message and just some different spiritual questions people have. This person asks, is the spirit and the soul the same thing? Hebrews 4.12 seems to indicate that they're different. If they are different, can you explain? If they're the same, then what is meant by division of the soul and spirit, and why is there no mention of the holy soul in the Bible? Yeah, they're, they're not the same, and you have this, again, a little different in 1 Thessalonians 5. I um, can't remember the exact verse. But it's, uh, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be held blameless to the day of the coming of Christ. So they're they're different, and it's awfully hard to uh, uh, get get a clear depiction. But but essentially, the way I would divide it for a person is this, is that your your God-enlightened reasoning faculty, uh, along with your conscience, is kind of the component of your spirit. Uh, Those are different faculties. Uh, th- this would include imagination and that kind of thing. Whereas your, uh, your, your soul would consist of your mind, your emotions, and will. Now, obviously, there's, there's overlap. Mm-hmm. They, they, they interact, and of course, then they overlap again into your body. But, but your soul, if you kind of look at it as, as, a, as a ladder, you know, your body would be the, the lower part, but it's also the, the vehicle of expression that your, your soul expresses itself through its body, but, but we're meant to be tripartite beings that are led by our spirits. And so your God-enlightened reasoning and your conscience should lead your mind, your will, your emotions, and ultimately express itself through your body. Okay, that was a big word, tripartite. Tripartite. We're, we're meant tripartite? Yeah, uh, it just means we're three, three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Okay. Yeah, yeah and, and, and to be very fair, you know, there are some... Um, uh, theologians through the years that will say, no, we're, we're only spirit and soul. Uh-huh. I, I think that's clearly mistaken from Scripture, but it's not that big of a deal experientially speaking. Okay, you know? so the question I have is, did you make up that word or is it a real no, word? No, 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 that's a real it's word. Real. Okay, because yeah. sometimes... No, that's a, that's a theological words. word, yeah. Sometimes yeah, and why aren't my words as good as anybody else's? Yeah. Somebody's making up words. Exactly. Theirs get put in a dictionary, why shouldn't mine? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're going to take a different turn with this question. How do we interpret what we are seeing when it comes to the Christian church today, particularly Christian leaders? For example, some Christian leaders will condemn person A for behavior. However, if person B does the exact same behavior, the same leaders say we need to give them grace. I'm confused. Isn't a sin a sin no matter who does it? Well, a sin is certainly a sin no matter who does it. <laughs> as far as the other part, I, I'm just not even sure what the person's getting at. And it's so subjective, it's like, what leader or where? What's the yeah. subject? What's the I, I mean, you know, I, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but um, I'm, I'm going to say something. I hope this person doesn't get insulted by this. I just think you're fixating on something that is not healthy, and it's trivial, and there, there, are, there are things that we should focus on in our walk with Christ, our developmental journey, that are far more important. And, what this one's saying and that one's saying and this leader's opinion and that leader's opinion, man, fix your eyes on Jesus, what Scripture says, the author and finisher of our faith, and follow him. Mm-hmm. 
I, I think these things can be disruptive distractions. And so I, I, wouldn't, I just wouldn't let myself get consumed in this. And I hope I'm not being insulting to this person, but it's just my thoughts. Yeah, it's kind of focus on what we can deal with ourselves, yeah. look to Christ, and Ex exactly. get there instead yeah. of this one. Now. Yeah, if you, you're always looking around, what does his leader say, and why don't they condemn this, why don't they, it's like, and, and at the end of the day, so what? Um, we are to live for Christ, and we will answer to Christ, so what difference does this make? You know? Yeah. Okay, Let, let's jump down to this one. Uh, we've kind of dealt with it before. Is cremation biblical? Um. It's not biblical or unbiblical. It's not mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no one singular way that the uh, disposal of a human body is laid out in Scripture. There's no one right way or biblical way. So whether you bury someone or whether you have them cremated, it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. I think people used to get caught up in the idea. It's like burning in hell if you burn a body or something. You know. I, I think that is think what what through, through people. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, well, when you think about it, you know, there have been many Christians that were burned at the yeah, stake for their faith. Martyred. So they didn't want to be cremated, but they were. Yeah. And obviously God's not going to have any difficulty calling back their, their uh, yeah. atomic structure when Resurrection Day comes. Yeah. So. Okay. We'll go ahead and jump over here, too, because I think you can answer this one quickly. Someone says that you've mentioned a version of the Bible that you came across when you mm -hmm. just became a Christian. A topical study version, what version was this? They asked Strong's Concordance, but you could explain mm -hmm. what Strong's is in this too. But. Yeah, no, th this, is a, this is a study Bible, and I don't recommend it these days because it doesn't have a lot of study notes in it. Let me rephrase that. It does have study notes in it, but they're all toward the back, as opposed to most modern-day study Bibles have the notes right under the, the verses you're reading, and so if you have a yeah. trouble with a verse, usually they'll give you a little help in understanding it. But this, to me, it just works for my brain. I don't know if it works for everybody else's, but it's called a Thompson Chain Reference Topical Study Bible. Thompson Chain Reference Study Bible. And here's what's unique about it. As you're reading uh, any portion of Scripture, there are two columns, one on the left, one on the right, and they are right beside the verses. And so let's say you read a verse that says, uh, By grace are you saved through faith, you know, Ephesians 2.8. Uh, it's the gift of God, not a works, less than which boasts. Okay, well, it'll have a little right beside the, that verse, it'll have a word faith, because it says by grace, are you saved through faith? It'll have the word grace. And beside faith and grace, it'll have a number. Well, if you look at that number in the back of the Bible, it'll have a whole list of scriptures, both from Old and New Testament. So for grace, you'd see tons of other verses that give you a clearer picture on what the Bible teaches about grace from cover to cover. For faith, what it teaches about faith from cover to cover. It, it teaches you without trying to, to think topically. For me, this was extraordinarily helpful. So that now, when a person mentions any, any kind of a subject, I have a, a head full of, of scriptures that I may not be able to quote word for word, but I can then take someone, if I had to, to those scriptures. And I know what the Bible teaches on any given subject because I've, I've, my mind has been trained by this Bible to mm -hmm. think topically. Not saying it's the best tool for everybody, it's worked wonderfully for me through the years, mm -hmm. so, uh, but it's called the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Okay, and we'll get that in the comments there for people. And um, how about, you want to explain what a strong concordance is? Oh, strong concordance. concordance. Okay, uh, concordance, when you get an exhaustive concordance, it, it takes every single word that there is in the Bible, like, like let's just take the word grace again. The concordance, you could, you could open it up to the word grace, and it will have listed every single verse in the entire Bible where grace is used. It'll have your Hebrew or Greek um, equivalent, you know, the, what, what the original language word was, and it, you can just see how a word is used in various places throughout Scripture. So let, let, I'll show you how, how it can be handy. Sometimes you say, man, what was that verse? I know this is a verse about by grace are you saved through faith, but I don't know, is it in Romans? Is it in Leviticus? Where is it at? Well, you go to that. And you can see, you can look it up, and you go, oh, there it is, it's in Ephesians 2.8. You know? yeah. So that, that, that's one. There's lots of other uses, right. believe me. But when you first start out, that's the most handy use. When you find it in the original uh, language, too, and the yes. definition of that's really helpful. I always thought it was called exhaustive because it's so big and heavy that you, it, it exhausts you to carry. To carry. <laughs> it's such a big book. Yeah, or, or it's what it did to the original people that wrote yeah. it. Can you it imagine was, the, the people that did this? They did it by candlelight, and they had no computers. That's just I mean, the original people that wrote yeah. these concordances mm -hmm. things like that, this is before electricity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to mention, too, in our FCF store, we sell a study Bible. We sell this life application study Bible. Yeah. And like Randy said, every 
uh, every page you've got notes right below the scripture that can help expand it, yeah. explain it. You have an introductory page to each book as you start it to give you an overview. This is what this book is about when it was written by who, for what purpose, and so forth. Uh, so we and really I recommend. I really recommend those above the Thompson Chain reference. The Thompson Chain reference requires you to have lots of other study books as you're starting to learn the Bible. Whereas these newer study Bibles, they give you the, you know, the historical context of the book, they, they give you uh, dating, they give you all, just all kinds of things. Yeah. Immediately you see it, you can get right into it and read it. Yeah. The Thompson Chain Reference is great if you want to give yourself time to um, study topically and, and for you to have an assortment of other books that are going to give you historical context and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, this person asks about uh, Christian organizations that are faith-based funded, so meaning an employee has to raise their own financial support. I'll just kind of, somebody, they're referring to one example, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I think this person has maybe been offered something there, so, but they basically have to raise their own salary. Um, so what do you think about these organizations? Hmm. Um, let's see. This opens up... Um, a very complicated subject, and um, it, it, it's one I do have kind of strong feelings about, but I want to try to um, be careful how I say this. Okay, um, the, these organizations <laughs> uh, shouldn't have to exist, I'll put it like that. They should, they should not have to exist, all right? Um, Local, when we look at the scripture, Jesus says he is building his church. It is the church that he says is his body. Um, there's no notion in scripture of these independent structures that function outside of a local church. Ministries should flow from a local church. So whether it's Fellowship of Christian Athletes, whether it's Young Life, Youth for Christ, uh, uh, what, what's that other one? Uh, Bill Bright's group, um, uh, Campus, um, Camp, Camp, Campus Crusade for Christ, whatever they call themselves today, Crew or whatever. Yeah. The, the, these are all things that have happened just in modern times. And here's my problem with them. Um, they, they all claim to be specializing in areas that the churches are not. That's true to, to a degree. It's true. They all are dependent, though, upon local churches for their support. They all claim that they will then uh, take the people that they are reaching and make very sure that they are placed in local churches, which is the plan of God. You know, they're, they're, if we go back into New Testament Christianity, there was no thought of a person being a Christian and not being a disciple and not being a part of a local church. The two were one. And yet... I'm old enough now to say what I'm going to say. You know, I've been a Christian 45 years, and I've watched these organizations. I've interacted with them. We've even worked with them. We've supported them. Categorically across the board, it is rare that they ever, ever really, truly function in a coordinated fashion with local churches. They become entities unto themselves. They want to drain the resources of a local church, both manpower and money, but rarely do they ever bring the people they are supposedly reaching into a state of true discipleship. Number one, Jesus didn't call us to just go and talk to people about him. He called us to make disciples. I don't see these organizations doing that for the most part with the most of the people, nor do they ever connect these people effectively to local churches. And if you don't do that, you've completely left this person hanging. I, I've, I've heard so many stories through the years. People come through our church, it's like, oh yeah, you know, 25 years ago, I was in young life, I was in this, I was in that, and then, you know, I kind of grew out of it because, you know, it only goes up to high school or whatever, and then I just kind of drifted around and wandered for 25 years, and, and now I'm back, mm -hmm. and I'm in a local church, and I'm thinking, yeah, here we go again. Um, now, the criticism could be leveled, yes, but the local churches are not doing these specialized ministries for athletes or students and all like that. Well, is that true or is it not true? And, and, and are these groups doing effective ministry? I, I, I question that. They, they gather people, they talk to them about Christian stuff, okay, but I don't see them making disciples, and that's what Jesus called us to do. At the end of the day, he called us to make disciples. That's, that's people that have not only put trust in Christ, but now they'll identify as I am following him. I am willfully choosing to learn his word, his will, and his ways, and to let them mold and shape my life. I don't see these organizations producing that. They produce a lot of kids that, that are somewhat loosely interested in religious stuff, 
Christ, Christ stuff. They use Christ language. They use biblical language. But, but I, I don't see it happening. And then you get people like this, that, okay, these organizations say, okay, you want to work for our organization? Go knock on the door, so to speak, of all the people that are in the local church. That's who you're going to go to. You're going to go to people in the local church. You're, you're, going, you're doing an in run on the budget of a local church. We, 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 have, we have a very clear concept in this church that I think is biblical, and every local church ought to function this way. We have a process where we determine each year, once a year, what all the funds are going to be dedicated to. Okay? That's it. But the, what these groups then do is they come in and they go in run around the local church budget. They say, oh, no, 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 even though you, you've decided this is what your church is going to function on, we're going to come and talk to your people individually and get them to support us too because we don't agree with the direction of your local church. We think uh, funds ought to be going in different directions. This is disruptive to local churches. It drains them and it puts the person in my mind, in a very uncomfortable position where I'm going to individuals and I'm asking them to support me mm -hmm. going outside of the local church, mind you. Now, if they wanted to do it right, they should come to the local church and say, would you consider me for your budget item this year? Mm -hmm. That would be the appropriate way to do it. They don't do that, though. They send these people out. These people, um, it's kind of like one of these pyramid schemes. They use friends and family members and everything else. And so I have tremendous problems with this process and these organizations all together. And they are a rather um, new phenomenon. I mean, if you go back to where they probably started in root, um, in America, the YMCA. The YMCA was originally a Christian outreach um, program. And, of course, what is it now? You couldn't get saved in a YMCA if you had to, you know. I mean, they're, they're not going to talk to you about Christ and being his follower. So they, they originate with good intent, specialized groups, to reach what they feel are target audiences, unique target audiences that are not being reached by local churches. Local churches do reach, they just don't reach with the same approach that these groups do. And at the end of the day, I'm not believing these groups are reaching anybody. I'm not seeing the results that they are claiming. You know, oh, look, we had 40 people make decisions this year, and that means what? Where are these people five years from now, 10 years from now? Are they plugged into a local church serving Christ? Uh, living a Christ-like life, that's not the, that's not the storyline. Okay, I know this was a bad, this was a, this was a touchy topic with me. Uh, par, parachurch yeah. ministries, I am pretty much opposed to. I don't see them as being biblical. Yeah. I tolerate them, yeah. but I don't believe in them. Okay. I, I think, too, the person who wants to go into a ministry area like this, I know their heart is there because they want to do something. Yes. But what, yes. what I have seen is that the person in that half of their time ends up being consumed with this pressure of fundraising. Like they, they want, they think they're going in for ministry. Literally half or more is constantly fundraising. What are we going to do next? And then, like you say, it's this ick factor. When I'm fundraising, I'm, I'm actually more asking for my salary. And it's this uncomfortable, like, and, and okay, that, all the money, you know, you're going to our ministry. No, it's really to pay my salary. So it's an uncomfortable thing. And on top of that, these organizations take a chunk of the yeah. money that these people raise. Yeah, so so they, they don't even get the money they raise. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, these people are not connecting these people effectively. I challenge any of them, show me how you're effectively connecting all your people to local churches. And if you are not, you are running counter to the will of God. I, I'll, I'll have that conversation with any of them. Yeah. You're, you're doing religious stuff, but you're not doing what Jesus said to do. Yeah, yeah. So... Bottom line, how do you feel about it? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Let's move on. Okay, I think that was kind of clear. But I, I really, for the person interested, like it, it's such a pressure. And I don't mean I don't mean to be discouraging mm -hmm. to people, and 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 I don't mean to. I know it sounds like I'm trashing these organizations. I'm not. I'm trashing the concept behind these organizations. Right. The people in them are godly people that really want to serve God and really want to reach people for Christ. I'm just saying this isn't the way. Okay. All right, we're going to go back in the Old Testament now. Is there reason to believe that Abraham and other faithful followers in the Old Testament found it easier to obey God because they could hear him audibly? I understand that they still had free will and God doesn't want us to obey him because of force of fear. I also understand that they did not have a Bible in front of them to guide them. But still, I wonder, if God spoke audibly to me and made me a promise about a certain circumstance in my life, wouldn't it be easier to trust in his plans because I actually heard him say it out loud? I'm going to answer that before I do. I really need to say something else. Back to that same question. I know <laughs> there's somebody sitting out there, and you're thinking, man, 
if it hadn't been for that Youth for Christ worker or that Young Life worker, I would have never known Christ, and that changed my life. I understand that. I truly understand that. So I'm not trying to say that no good comes right. from these ministries. I'm just saying it could be done differently. Yeah. You know? Fundamentally as a... Yes, the, yes. Uh, uh, the okay, okay, now let me go back to that question. The problem with the question, and, and, and I, I'm a little scared for this person. Uh, I hope they're listening. I'm a little scared for you because at the root of your question is this. You're, you're kind of saying what the Pharisees said to Jesus at one point. He had already done hundreds of miracles before their eyes. But they wanted to see something so compelling that it was like the radar gun on the highway. It's like, no sense in speeding. Or, or like the cameras. I just got a ticket from one of those things recently. Oh, <laughs> I hate when that comes uh, to the mail. <laughs> so, so what this person is saying is if I could hear God's voice, then I'd know for sure that he existed. And I think that that would really motivate me more. That's really problematic mm -hmm. uh, because it's saying that I need some kind of a, uh, a jolting assurance that he's there to motivate me. The revelation that he's given of himself in creation and in his word, it's okay, <laughs> but if I could hear him, I think that would really motivate me more. That's problematic, and, and whoever this person is, I hope they're listening, and I hope you think this through. Because Jesus said of that, those individuals that wanted yet another sign, he called them a wicked and adulterous generation because what he knew they meant was this, unless you scare the crap out of me, unless I'm so assured that you're there and I can't avoid you, I'm not going to be so motivated to serve you. Mm -hmm. That's problematic. Um, now, I'm not saying this person's there, but their question hints at that frame of mind, that, that oh, yeah, if I could see him, I'd be much more motivated to serve him. Um, he has given a sufficient revelation. It's a perfect revelation because it doesn't provide that, that kind of a overwhelming evidence that would freeze our wills to... It's no different than the illustration I've given a million times. If I'm a shoplifter and I'm in the store to do, do some shoplifting, but I see the cop there, I'm going to behave like a perfect citizen. But I'm still a shoplifter. Mm -hmm. I'm just behaving because I can't get away with it. Mm -hmm. And when you ask a question like that, it, it's hinting at the same thing. And I'll go a little further to put a better construction on their question. I don't think it would have because, okay, when you hear a voice, you at some point in your life are going to contemplate, did I really, was that, was that a psychological problem? Mm -hmm. what, did I really hear that? How do I know? I'm, am I going to pin my life on that voice? Whereas with Scripture, we have an, uh, an ongoing body of revelation that, that is uh, available and can affirm um, what God's will is and that kind of a thing. What's the portion of Scripture where, I guess, Jesus is talking about those who've seen, but then even greater those who have not seen and yet mm -hmm. believe? It's, uh, it's in John chapter uh, 17, where he, it's his last night with his disciples, and he's saying, you know, uh, blessed are those that believe yet have not seen. You know, blessed yeah. are you, you've seen and believe, but more blessed are those who have not seen and believe. And Peter talks about the same thing, that even though we have not yet seen him, we love him and, and that kind of yeah. thing. So. Yeah. so I hope that's an encouragement to you, that you haven't seen and still can trust. Yeah. You know, but we've yeah. seen plenty. Right? Well, yeah, seen the, the scriptural revelation we have of God in Christ and the historic revelation in the Bible, it's actually more than what a voice would be. Yeah. You know, a voice could happen one time, never again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... On that, piggybacking on that, this person wants to know, how are you sure that Christianity is the right religion and other religions that have been around longer are not the right one? Well, the problem with the question is the word religion. Yeah. Um, and, and I understand what they mean, but you, you have to ask some fundamental questions. You have to ask, and, and this is going to get into the next question, where did God come from? <laughs> yeah. um, you, you know, if, if you embrace the the concept, the notion that there had to be a first cause, an eternal first cause. The first cause would have had to be eternal. And so there is a creator. Let's just start there. If you embrace the notion that there is a creator of the universe who is rightly called God or divine, then the only thing that matters is who that divinity is, that singular divinity, that singular creator is, and what does that creator uh, want from we, the created? Okay, so, so forget the idea of religion, because religion is this notion that there's this smorgasbord. You know, you go in, there's, you, there's that food for this one and that food for that one, and it doesn't really matter. You just kind of pick and choose, and hey, that food 
was made before this food, so why isn't it the right food to eat, you know? Well, well it's a fallacious notion, first of all, because uh, to say that other religions have been around longer than Christianity, that's not true. Christianity, yeah, I know what they mean, it started with Jesus, but the Bible, the biblical revelation goes back to eternity past, mm -hmm. okay? So you're talking about the beginning of everything is where the, the biblical revelation, which then leads into Christianity. Christianity is the final step in a progressive revelation that the Creator has given to humanity and, and to the angelic realms of Himself. So there is no religion, not in China, not anywhere, uh, not in India, um, that is before uh, the biblical revelation. Now I know what they're trying to say. Well, Jesus didn't come along you know, until about 2,000 years ago. The writings in uh, you know, the, the, the India, for example, go way, way, way past that. But, but they don't go past the Bible. The Bible goes back to the very beginning. So the notion there is, is, is wrong-headed in a few ways. It's wrong-headed in you can't compare religion. The, the, forget the word religion. It's a poor word. It's a bad word. Religion is always the same thing. It is me as a human being trying to figure out a couple things. If there is a deity there, and if that deity is going to have some impact on my life, and I can't control that deity, I want to figure out what does this deity want out of me, and how can I get on this deity's right side? I want, I want the deity on my side and off my back. I, I, I want to find a formula. What, what does the deity want? The deity want me to take a pilgrimage? I'll take a pilgrimage. The deity want me to light some candles? I'll light some candles. The deity want me to eat some fish on Friday? I'll eat some fish on Friday. That's religion. That's not what we have in the Bible. The Bible is the Creator revealing Himself to those He created and saying, I love you. This is how I created you to live and walk. This is the life that will, will bless you beyond your, your wildest imaginations. This is what I created you to be, and this is what I created you to do. Come learn. Come, come trust me. That's not a religion. That's life. That's life. It's entirely different. I'm not doing anything to appease the deity. I'm not doing anything to please the deity. I'm not trying to get the deity off my back and on my side. I'm, I'm, I'm like a child saying, Father, is this your way? I, I'm here to learn. I trust you. I, I want to learn your ways. That's different than religion. And, and you have to go back to the root, to the Creator Himself. That's the next question. Where did God come from? of necessity, because there is something instead of nothing. In other words, because we live in a universe that obviously is full of some things, well then everything had to come from a someone, because, this gets complicated, because nothing can't come from, or, or, or something cannot come from nothing, okay? And we see no evidence anywhere of some things, particularly some things with life coming from dead matter, but even dead matter had to come from somewhere. Some, yeah, yeah. And, and so, although it hurts your brain, it hurts our brains to think about this, of necessity, the Creator had to be eternal, which meant He somehow has always been. Now, of course, our minds are like, well, no, 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 that doesn't work in my brain because I, I can always trace back, you know, I had a, I had a mother and then I had a grandmother, and, yeah. Yeah. But, but someone, it's a very logical, mm -hmm. someone had to be here uh, at the beginning and that someone would have had to have been eternal. We, we, we know even on a scientific level now through the Hubble telescope that uh, the likelihood is the universe did not exist. 13 and a half billion years ago, it did not exist. Something we call the Big Bang. They, everything is moving out like this. They can trace it back to a pinpoint in time. And there was a time when nothing existed. And that's when God spoke and the universe came into existence. But He would have had to have been forever. Something doesn't come from nothing. And living things don't come from lifeless things. We, 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 we know this by observation and reason. Okay. Here we go. I think this is our last question. We had some on the comments, but again, with time, I think we'll, we should hold them for next week. Okay. Unless there's anything desperately. Okay. Are there any yeah. life and death ones? I don't think so. <laughs> Let's go with this one. Uh, I've been searching the Bible for advice from God on how to handle an obstacle I'm facing in my marriage. My husband is driven to provide for our family financially in a way that causes him to be completely absent most weeks during the awake hours of our family. I've been reading that respecting him and fulfilling my role as a wife and mother is what I am to do and pray, pray, pray. But is there something I'm missing that could help open doors for our family? I know God wants both of us presently raising our family together, and I feel this strain on my heart daily. 
Yeah, I mean, without knowing the specifics in the situation, I, I think, you know, you guys have got to talk to each other about it and look at it. But, but here, l- let me balance this out because this is a pretty common complaint um, today. And somebody in most families, I mean, in, 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 let me rephrase it. In today's world, usually both people are working, which makes it extraordinarily difficult to uh, give children the attention they deserve. But in families where one person is the breadwinner, uh, an inordinate amount of their time is going to be put into making a living. And today, um, we, we, we're like the fishing water. All, all we know is what we've been born into. And we have been born into a world that has tons, this is going to sound crazy to people, but I can prove this, tons of extra time. Okay, We're the first generation in human history that has had tons of extra time. I mean, we, the, the fact that we can even talk about extra time, leisure time, you, you know, uh, th- this wasn't the experience. There's 108 billion people who lived and died on planet Earth, probably at least 100 or so of them, uh, they work from sun up to sundown just to survive. There was not much time for anything but survival-oriented activity. So now all of a sudden today we have these extraordinary standards that are put on people. So I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to say, have a conversation, try to look at this thing a little more sane. Don't let society standards dictate what you determine is normal and abnormal, right or wrong, because you might have a very rational, reasonable, good situation, and you just don't know it. Let's put this in another perspective. Uh, let's suppose your, your husband or your spouse was in the military. They might be gone on mission for a year or two at a time. Uh, they're not going to spend any time at all with the family. Is this, a, is this legitimate? Or should, should this not be considered a legitimate way to earn a living for your family? Um, so so you, you just have to have some flexibility. I'm, I'm, I have a bias about this. I think we are... <laughs> this is going to make me sound bad. I'm just going to say it. I think we're so spoiled today because we don't understand history. We have no sense of history. We are so spoiled today that we expect too much. We expect too much from one another. We expect too much from relationships. We expect too much from life. Uh, we, ex- we, we just expect too much. And I think if we could dial it back a bit and learn to be content and thankful, we'd see that we have a much better situation than we think we do compared to the way most people that have lived and died on planet Earth ever had it. And so, so I, I'm fearful when I hear these kind of things that, that this is something that just needs to be talked about and... Um, it may not be nearly as bad as it sounds. Yeah, yeah, he could be a workaholic or something like that. That's a whole other conversation, but maybe not. Ma- ma- maybe not. You know. Yeah, and so I think it's one of those two because it, it, it is so hard sometimes. You just don't know where. Don't know the circumstance. So it could be a terrible situation, you know, where this person, you know, is really left out there and it's not necessary, and maybe yeah. it's a marital issue that needs to be dealt with. So if that, you know, if there's something else yes. there. Uh, by all means, again, like we say so often, set up a time to talk yeah. about your situation yep. to talk that through and to figure out where it falls then. Yeah, because you know? like you say, until you know the specifics of a yeah. situation, so, you know. Yeah. So uh, this week you're going to continue on Journey to Destiny, our second message, and you are talking about? Yeah, um, we said that the first step on the path of you know, experiencing the fulfillment of your God-given destiny is you've got to accept the vision that God has for our life, but no sooner do you get on that path by accepting God's vision for your life, His destiny for your life, you find abruptly you need to adjust your expectations. And uh, to give you an idea of what I mean, it's not an unusual thing to hear Christians today have conversations like this. They say that, boy, you know, I I was restless in where I was working before, and so I I just started praying, and I was thinking, man, maybe it's time for me to go. And so I finally did. You know, I made this change, and oh, my goodness, everything worked so smoothly. No sooner did I put my resume out there, I had this, this, uh, you know, contact, and boy, I got to the the place, and the the person interviewing me was a Christian, and the boss was a Christian, and all the people there were Christians, and it's all just flowed so smoothly. Man, when you find the will of God, it all just goes so smooth. Well... I'm not doubting that, but I can show you from Scripture that just the opposite is usually true. And it makes much more sense for just the opposite to be true because the the, the Scripture says that we are in a spiritual battle and that those that are trying to further the cause of Christ, trying to make Him known to their generation, trying to serve Him in their generation, 
that they're going to be going against the tide uh, because it says that of this world, whether we believe it or not, it says that Satan is the God, small g, of this age, that he's the ruler of the prince and the power of the air. Uh, he, he rules in the hearts of those that are not reconciled to God. And so what is more normative is that when you start to walk on the path of being who God wanted you to be and doing what he wanted you to do is you encounter struggle and stress. Now, now this is not what we want to hear today, mm -hmm. but here's what I want to make a, a plea for in this. There is such a thing in life as good stress and good struggle. And without good stress and good struggle, it is impossible for development and effective uh, uh, spreading of God's kingdom to occur. It will not happen mm -hmm. without good stress and good struggle. Good stress and good struggle do not destroy us, do not deteriorate us, they develop us. Um, so it, it does mean, though, when we get on this path of pursuing God's vision, you tend to have to adjust your expectations because, you know, if you have that thought that, man, now I know I'm in the will of God because everything is going mm -hmm. smooth, it's like the, the C parts, you know, and we'll, we'll get to a C parting, but that's a different circumstance. It's usually not the case. And so it's better to be prepared in advance for this so that you're not... Um, discouraged when, 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 when it starts to happen. So. Yeah, it's too smooth. It could just be Satan down there going, come on, come on. <laughs> a lot of times, a lot of times, and then you get there and the bridge is out. Yep, yep. The car All goes right. right off the edge. <laughs> okay, the other thing for Sunday is it's food truck Sunday, and we're also having a club expo, so our clubs are just these fun, non-threatening ways to connect with people around a similar uh, interest, you know, like the running club and so forth. So uh, we're going to have those kind of on display, and people can connect with some common interest kind of groups, and again, food trucks, okay. there's a common interest right there. Yes, I, I don't, I, I know it's going to rain all this week, but is it by the weekend perhaps going to clear up? Does anybody know the 10-day? Um, uh, I'm so know. hoping Sunday it, uh, no. you know. I don't know. Yeah, we hope it changes. They are start calling for some scattered stuff. I'm stuff. starting to believe in climate change. I think we've gotten Seattle's climate there here. You go. I, think so too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really believe in climate change. I just threw that out there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, all right, well, everybody... Let me rephrase uh, it. I believe in climate change. I don't think we're, man is causing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we're going to have a ton of questions about that. Next. That's okay. So, That's all right. Okay. They don't have um, to agree with me. I might be a nincompoop. Yep. All righty. We will... Um, everybody have a really good week, okay? And we'll see you Sunday for church and for some food trucks. And at food truck, make sure, you know, hey, hello, my name is. That's the start of every relationship you've ever had right there. And right after service, I'll be giving a lecture on climate change okay. if anybody would like to come Great. to that. Say and goodbye. next week, we're going to have better <laughs> video that is in focus. So enjoy. Oh, oh yeah. no, we have been out of focus.